from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, I'm Tomoko Steen, a uh, research spe specialist here at the Library of Congress Science, Technology and Business Division. Today's event is sponsored by Science and Technology and Business Division. And uh, we also have a partnership with uh, NASA and my colleagues back there, they work with NASA to um, some of the topics uh, covered uh, on uh, climate change. And uh, I just wanted to show our website here and um, event page, you can see some of the lectures, including those NASA climate change talks. I also have um, outside some of the guide related science policy and uh, uh, climate change or renewable energy. And uh, we have all the guide on our website as well. So um, I hope you can make use of it. You can download the updated uh, guide. Okay, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Peter Frumhoff, uh, Director of the Science Policy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And he's a global change ecologist. And uh, he has BA in psychology from UC San Diego, and also MS in zoology and PhD in ecology from UC Davis. He has taught at Harvard, Tufts, and the University of Maryland. And uh, we had a good chat earlier. Like, uh, we, have, we know common people from Harvard. And uh, um, he has been very influential for giving a talk like today. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed that talk. Um, his focus is a little bit uh, more policy compared to NASA talk. And uh, we have uh, some of the senior members from State Department and directors from uh, AAAS, and also some of the embassies, science attaches here. So I hope we have a good discussion after the lecture. Okay, um, so Dr. Firmenhoff has a long, you know, the CV, and uh, I can go on and on, but instead of spending that time, okay. Uh, please, <laughs> please join me to welcome Dr. Filmhoff. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Tomoko. I know this has been a, uh, a long time coming. We've been trying to find time to have this conversation. I'm really delighted. Uh, to be here with all of you, um, and particularly delighted to be here at the at the Library of Congress. It's um, it's a real um, pleasure to be at an institution that so more than any other embodies uh, the application of knowledge to governance and to public understanding. The whole breadth of knowledge, including uh, but not limited uh, science. Um, I want to just say a few words at the beginning about my organization, the Union of Concerned Scientists. We're a little newer than the Library of Congress. We were founded in. In 1969, um, also dedicated to the application of science to inform and motivate um, sound public policies and public understanding. Um, founded by a group of um, very senior physicists at MIT during the height of the Vietnam War, uh, who were deeply concerned about the singularity of funding for physics research coming from the Department of Defense and its application solely for military purposes. And they saw and desired to see a much greater support for other applications of physics uh, in support of societal benefits and the public good. Um, so UCS was founded to be both a, uh, a research organization and what I like to call a do tank, to apply uh, science uh, to inform public understanding, starting with issues where physicists had something to say about public uh, policy on energy, on nuclear power, on, on security issues, um, and broadening out to uh, encompass a much broader range of the sciences, including my field in ecology and, and biology, um, around global change, uh, uh, around climate change, around energy, uh, transportation, uh, sustainable agriculture, and most recently, we've had a long-standing body of work on ensuring the integrity of science and federal policy making in this country, and we've just um, kind of morphed that, as I'll say a little bit more today, into a wonderful new, um, 
uh, uh, institution that's just getting off the ground within UCS, uh, what we're calling a Center for Science and Democracy. And I want to say a little bit about that in the context of this conversation. Let's see. What do I need to do here? Um, enter? No. That's yeah, just, let's do that. oh, there we go. Got it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, uh, so our nation, much like UCS, was founded by men of science. Um, uh, unfortunately, men not at the time, not really uh, men and women, uh, but um, uh, they were all um, uh, 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 sons of children of the Enlightenment, uh, and not just uh, Ben Franklin, kind of the iconic uh, founder scientist. Uh, in a uh, discovering electricity in a lightning storm, uh, but Adams and Madison and Jefferson and, um, and and others were deeply grounded in the sciences. And as the historian of science Bernard Cohen has so uh, artfully characterized, their in, their sensibilities about science and the values of reason and openness and pragmatism uh, deeply informed uh, the design, the architecture of our founding documents and our governance. Um, uh, and of course, a tradition of um, uh, the furthering of science and its application and a pragmatic approach to policy making carried on for, 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 for many generations and continues in some parts today. Um, many of you know that um, the establishment of the National Academy of Sciences was um, authorized by President Lincoln uh, during the height of the Civil War uh, to inform uh, Congress and our nation's government more broadly uh, on um, issues where science had something to say about uh, about uh, governance and public policy. Um, and I was actually reminded in thinking about this lecture that um, here at the Library of Congress is um, uh, uh, Jefferson's letter to Meriwether Lewis, written in 1803, um, uh, giving him both the charge and the funding coming from Congress uh, for the uh, what became known as the Lewis and Clark Expedition, the scientific survey after it was really characterized in detail. And, in Jefferson's letter of the Louisiana Purchase and, 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 the, and the West. And um, it was um, really quite basic science intended to have much broader but unanticipated or unanticipatable public benefits. Um, that is the understanding of the West. And in fact, it was being sold to Congress as an opportunity to create information that could be used for the furthering of commerce. It's that combination of basic research, which is sometimes characterized as Newtonian science, and application, which is often characterized as Baconian science that led uh, the historian of science, uh, Gerald Holton, um, about a decade and a half ago to characterize federal investment in science for the public good as Jeffersonian science. Um, and it's, it's really an architecture, an approach to science um, that has characterized much of our federal support for, for um, big ideas, for investing in basic research in molecular bi biology with the intent of informing um, our understanding of how cancer operates, for example, our investment in understanding, um, uh, characterizing uh, uh, the ozone and the atmosphere, which ultimately helps support um, a response to the uh, impact of chlorofluorocarbons on the ozone layer, and many other domains in which science, um, f furthered by federal funding, has had applications to the, pu to the public good, both in medicine uh, and in the environment and many other domains. Um, and one can characterize our understanding of the Earth's climate system uh, as being in large part supported by an approach to Jeffersonian science, that is to say investments in both basic understanding of the Earth's climate, complicated system, uh, the impacts of humanity's actions on it, uh, and developing information that in a kind of pragmatic approach to governance could be used to address, identify, address, and help provide input into resolving uh, societal problems. This is the, um, the classic uh, uh, um, uh, result of the monitoring that was established in the 1950s by Dave Keeling at, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography that became the longest direct record of rising concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, as a result of um, increasing fossil fuels and burning of uh, forests in, in, in the atmosphere, rising from pre-industrial levels we now know about 280 parts per million to almost uh, just above 390 parts per million uh, today, a steady accumulation of carbon uh, the prominent, uh, predominant heat-trapping gas uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. I wanted just to highlight that um, the 
application and understanding of the impact of um, uh, uh, human impact on the on the atmosphere has had a has had a history not long after the development of the first information coming out of uh, Mauna Loa um, to inform uh, governance. Uh, in 1965, the Science Advisory Committee report to President Johnson said, and you can see it here, the continued use of fossil fuels will modify the heat balance of the atmosphere to such an extent that marked changes in climate, not controllable through local or even national efforts, uh, could occur. Only one of the first times that that uh, the climate science was put into the highest levels of government. And in fact, uh, President Johnson then uh, took that information in a very straightforward way and included it in his report uh, to Congress. Um, the first President Bush, of course, um, who, as some of you may recall, uh, ran in 1988 uh, 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 saying that he would uh, combat the greenhouse effect with the White House effect, um, uh, um, went on to do important things. Uh, as it relates to addressing the Earth's climate system in the early days of international architectures for climate. He, he signed the U.S. Uh, on to the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change in, in 1992, committing uh, absent ratification, but nonetheless committing uh, the U.S. and other governments to take actions consistent with preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference with the Earth's climate system. Um, and of course, uh, since uh, those early days of uh, bipartisan uh, pragmatic application of science to the understanding, climate science to our understanding and to thinking about how to address it in a, in a policy relevant way. We've had a, a, a tremendous accumulation of scientific information, much of it packaged into formalized reports, reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on which I've had the privilege of serving, uh, reports from the National Academy of Sciences, reports of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which come out every four years now with an uh, authorized report from con by Congress uh, on the state of uh, 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 climate change impacts on the United States. The next one will be coming out this next year. Uh, we know, for example, that we have, we have uh, uh, trends of uh, changes in extreme uh, heat, for example, that we see consistent with, with anthropogenic warming that, um, uh, uh, that we have in the continental U.S., and this is replicated in other uh, continents, um, instead of what you might expect under random uh, circumstances, that is to say not a human fingerprint, or roughly an equal number of record highs and record lows. We've seen an increasing number of record highs um, uh, across the United States over the uh, recent decades. Uh, and of course, this past year and the year before had very high um, extent of record heat across much of the United States, in part of a function of the La Nina, um, but demonstrably through a variety of measures, uh, a consequence that would not have happened at the extent but for the impact of anthropogenic warming. Um, we see a variety of indicators uh, of uh, human impact on the Earth's climate system. This really uh, most striking and sobering, um, to my mind anyway, of what we've seen um, on a global scale. Uh, this is the um, most recent data uh, 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 characterizing the record uh, decline in the extent of Arctic uh, sea ice. Um, this record low, much greater, much lower than what you can see as the that uh, kind of orange line of the median record, the median lows that occur in mid-September uh, over the period between 1979 and 2000, we've had a much more dramatic decline uh, in Arctic sea ice, both in extent and in volume that had been anticipated, um, that in fact much greater than our models uh, project, which is a, an indication of the limitations of climate models. In many respects, we they're they're useful, but they're not perfect, and um, and this is one case where. Um, they've been way too conservative. The Arctic sea ice is declining much more rapidly than we had anticipated, um, and uh, opening up passages that really had never been opened before, and um, creating the anticipation that we may see an ice-free Arctic in the summertime sometime in the next uh, couple of decades, really nothing that, um, that the climate science community uh, had anticipated. Um, and we've been able to develop information that projects forward uh, at regional scale, at, at if you will, decision-making relevant scale. Um, this is a body of work that, that I've had the privilege of leading. I've done a number of regional assessments of climate change across the United States in collaboration with, with uh, colleagues across the country. This is work um, uh, from uh, uh, 2004 uh, with uh, leading climate science colleagues in California looking, among other things, at the impacts of projected impacts of warming on Sierra snowpack. California is my, my home state, and um, I spent a lot of time uh, working with uh, 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 scientific colleagues there and then with the public and, and decision makers to take this kind of information and help use it to inform um, decision making again in that kind of 
if you will, uh, pragmatic sense of how science can be an input into rational decision making. This just shows by the, by the end of the century, um, really under even, a, again, depending on the emissions choices we make, it may be uh, more or less extent, but that um, just the basic uh, uh, effect of rising temperature uh, with um, uh, precipitation falling as rain rather than as snow and as snow uh, melting earlier, that this hugely important uh, resource, water resource, uh, the Sierra snowpack, um, important for, for agriculture, for human use, for in-stream use, um, is projected to decline, just really a basic function of, of physics. Um, and that kind of information, um, again, uh, I've had the privilege of working with, uh, with leaders across the political divide in, in California. This is Governor Schwarzenegger, then Governor Schwarzenegger, in the, uh, uh, about uh, six years ago, um, uh, taking action consistent with the science, informed by the science, informed by a robust uh, public discourse in that state. Um, action both to reduce emissions in California and to help prepare the state uh, uh, for impacts that are not avoidable, that is to say, to adapt. And that's continued now under the leadership of Jerry Brown. There are places in this country where we are having um, more or less fact-based dialogues um, that are both public and policy relevant and informing uh, decision making. Um, but we're not having them everywhere. Um, uh, and that's really the purpose of this talk is to help think about how we can build that kind of and restore that, that, uh, that uh, uh, rational approach from uh, integrating science into decision making. Uh, the, I don't mean to pick on uh, the good senator uh, from Pennsylvania, but uh, in, in, uh, the, uh, in, in, in the presidential primaries, there were a number of statements made by a number of, of national leaders, in this case national political leaders, uh, that like this um, uh, deeply misrepresented uh, the science of climate change. Um, there are um, a, a whole suite of institutions. This happens to be a billboard in Chicago um, this spring from, uh, uh, funded by an organization called the Heartland Institute, one of a number of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, institutions um, in part funded by um, fossil industry and by others um, who have been putting out information um, uh, well, you can, you can decide what you think of it, but it's, um, in my view, um, uh, really a, uh, uh, a disgrace uh, to have this be all consistent with the First Amendment, but nonetheless a, a disgrace to have uh, misrepresentations of science uh, characterized in this way. Um, uh, and we've seen um, in, while there are uh, places where science is being integrated in a, in a reasonable way in decision making, it's not happening federally. Um, we're not really having a national conversation about the facts of climate change and what to do about them. We might disagree on about what to do about them, but at least we should be getting our facts uh, straight and consistent. As the former senator from uh, New York, uh, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, famously said, "You can everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but no one's entitled to their own facts. Um, but we're acting like we're entitled to our own facts. And um, uh, uh, in August, in the good state of North Carolina, um, uh, there had been a, a, a body of work done by North Carolina scientists and a number of others uh, to put forward information on projected sea level rise, uh, which is projected conservatively to be about, um, about 39 inches, just over a meter um, over the course of this century. Information that can and should and is elsewhere informing, for example, zoning and development planning um, in a state that has, uh, as you can probably see from uh, the right-hand chart, all that green is, uh, that deep green is, is less than a meter um, uh, above sea level um, in the 20 coastal counties of North Carolina. Um, but the state of North Carolina uh, decided to, um, at least temporarily, at least for the next four years, uh, uh, require uh, that the science of sea level rise not be incorporated into coastal planning. That is to rely solely on the um, historic rates of sea level rise, uh, which don't take into account the uh, increasing levels that are resulting as a consequence of, of uh, uh, increased volume of ocean that happens as water warms and the, and the beginning of the uh, melt of land-based ice in Greenland and elsewhere. Um, so, uh, you know, you can, you can pass laws, but you can't change the laws of physics. And um, uh, uh, w this is an example of where science isn't just being ignored, it's being actively dismissed, um, and uh, uh, there was considerable pressure from coastal developers and others to, uh, to take this action. It's lasting, I think, until, 1960, uh, until 2016, and then will be revisited. 
And my hope is, and we're doing some work to help encourage it, that at least at that time, uh, there may be a better place for science at the table to inform uh, the policy discussion. Well, as a result of all of this, um, uh, that we have a, a, a deeply and widely confused American public uh, on the topic of, of global warming. Um, Tony Lucero, with colleagues in Yale, at Yale, and in, in partnership with folks at George Mason, have done some of the best uh, polling on this. Some of you may be familiar with the, their work on Six Americas. Um, uh, what it characterizes is um, there are ends of the spectrum. There are people who are singularly alarmed. Really, no matter what you tell them, they're going to become more alarmed. Um, uh, there are people on the, in this case, the far right end of the spectrum, um, uh, of this particular spectrum, um, who are um, uh, uh, deeply dismissive. And a lot of folks in the middle, and this is an important point, who are just confused. They may not be paying attention because this is not an issue which is, which is front and center for most folks most of the time, um, but that by a variety of um, uh, quite robust uh, questions uh, uh, really um, just don't know uh, what, what's up. Um, and uh, uh, for those that do have strong opinions, those opinions are divided uh, among partisan lines. Um, so if you ask the question, this is work by, done uh, a couple years ago by the Pew Research Center, um, if you ask the question, do scientists agree uh, that the Earth is getting warmer because of human activity, um, uh, there is a divide that's really a partisan divide. Democrats um, tend to uh, agree with that statement, um, and Republicans, and particularly folks who self-identify with the Tea Party, um, tend to disagree with that statement. Now, I want to be really clear. It is not the case that Democrats get science better than Republicans. Uh, and I want to, we can come back and talk about that. Um, uh, uh, and there are plenty of examples of, of science that is not incorporated in, into public understanding. Let's take the issue of autism and vaccines, for example, where we can talk about that too if you'd like, which doesn't divide among partisan lines. That is the misperception inconsistent with the science that, that vaccines are somehow a, a driver of, of childhood autism or other, other uh, diseases. Um, uh, so not everything around science is divided among partisan lines. This is, and we can, we can discuss why that may be. Um, well, one of the reasons why it, it may be is that um, uh, people get their information from lots of different sources. People tend to go to the sources in this highly diversified uh, media environment, both digital and, and, uh, and print, that, um, that reinforce the values that they already hold, whether it be um, MSNBC or Fox News or NPR. Uh, people tend to get information from folks who, with whom they already agree philosophically and culturally across a range of issues. And it's very difficult to build that kind of broader dialogue about what are the facts when, when everybody is so channeled into a fairly narrow spectrum of, of sources of information across the spectrum. Um, this is, of course, part of a larger set of cultural trends uh, in this country, what I like to call the disappearing center of American uh, politics. Um, just over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, um, it used to be the case that there were um, uh, uh, this is in the Senate, Republicans who would uh, tend to vote more liberally, as uh, consistent with many Democrats, and Democrats who tend to vote more conservatively, um, uh, consistent with many Republicans, and that, that crossover doesn't happen anymore. Right? We have had a, we've had a real separation among partisan lines of how, in this case, the Senate votes, and, and really very few people who stay in, in political office for long at this level who are or who might call themselves and are seen as, as centrist. Um, um, so, so what do you do about this? Um, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> I know I love this slide. Uh, you, you know, you can't, you can't respond to every bit of misinformation that's out there, right? I mean, you can, and there are people who do, but, but it's not necessarily the most useful thing to do. Um, and as scientists, um, I mean, we work a lot with folks in the scientific <laughs> community, we might want to agitate for, you know, pay attention to our science. Um, uh, but that's not really going to help either. I mean, I should say the other broader cultural trend that's happened over the past couple of decades, I would argue, is a, is a decline in the cultural authority of various institutions, including scientific institutions. That is to say, the National Academy can come out with a report uh, and it doesn't have the same weight as it might have had 
uh, 20, 30 years ago. People aren't, partly because of the diversification of media and partly because, um, uh, for lack of a better word, elites don't have as much influence and power um, in this society, I would argue, today as, as they may have had elites in this case, including scientists. Even though public opinion polling around scientists, um, what do people think about scientists is very positive as compared to, say, members of Congress, um, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, that doesn't necessarily translate into, first of all, people don't know scientists. Polling suggests that most people think, if you ask people, you know, name a living scientist, most people name Albert Einstein. Um, uh, it, it, you know, we, we, people don't know the scientific community. They don't have that dialogue. No, people don't have, it's not a large and influential community, and that's one of the things we're trying to uh, change in, in a sort of, if you will, our theory of change or how to help reestablish a pragmatic and, and, and an appropriate role for science in informing decision-making. Now, my organization, the Union of Concerned Scientists, is one of many, um, including scientific societies. I'm pleased that a colleague here, Rachel, is from the American Chemical Society doing uh, good work on this. Uh, federal agencies um, such as NOAA, the National Academy, and others who are working in a variety of ways to amplify and make more effective the voices of the scientific community to inform public understanding of climate change. I want to just say a few words, really a very few words about some of what we're doing and, and, and if you will, our approach. Um, so kind of rule number one is get the facts right um, and help the media, whatever the media is, whatever sources of information people are responding to, get the facts right. This is just a simple little uh, information graphic or infographic that, that we put out this summer in response to, um, as you know, there have been a tremendous number of unusual extreme events, right? Whether it be hurricanes or tornadoes or, um, or heat waves. And um, uh, people draw their own conclusions about what they mean as it relates to climate change. And, and the facts are, the facts are this, uh, that um, some extreme events, um, we have much better evidence for being increasing both in severity and frequency as a consequence of anthropogenic warming than others. And so um, although the media might report about the links between tornadoes and, and, and climate change, the, the data aren't there. So part of what we want to make sure we do is that we not only get the facts right ourselves, but we help others do. So this is something that went out to, to reporters uh, across the country to help them distinguish what's real from what's not because the source of this, an IPCC report, was virtually impenetrable in terms of what individual reporters, many of whom don't have backgrounds in the sciences or time to read large IPCC reports, can actually glean. Um, our second uh, rule, if you will, is to, is to start with where people are. There are many parts of the country where um, you just can't go give a talk on climate change and expect people to have open minds because people filter information and lessons from the social sciences um, fairly actively. Uh, and uh, people have preset ideas about, in this case, uh, global warming in many parts of the country that are not conducive to that kind of conversation. So, so um, but people care uh, in many parts of the South, for example, about football. Uh, and uh, in, the, in, in August of 2011, we've had now had two summers of extreme record heat across much of the South, Texas, Louisiana, and elsewhere. Um, there was a lot of, um, there was some science that was coming out uh, by a number of colleagues, including a professor at the University of Georgia, um, characterizing the uh, health risks of extreme summer heat to high school football players who are doing two-a-day practices uh, in August, right before school starts. Now, people care about football, and they're concerned about uh, uh, the health of their youth. Um, and so what we did, again, just by starting as an example of many things we've done, but just as a kind of story, truthful story, um, uh, we organized a group of, of leading experts, many of them from the, in this case, from the South, where, where football is, is king, um, uh, who could speak to the health risks of, of, uh, uh, of extreme heat on high school football players who have the data, who've been producing reports, and then other colleagues, including um, Dee Garnt from, from NOAA, to speak to put this in a climate change context, and held a series of um, press briefings uh, around the region where we brought these local experts, if you will, local, meaning that they, people can connect to them from in their own backyards, talk about issues that matter in a local context. So this was the kind of the headline of the press briefing um, that we organized. Um, it got tremendous, tremendous coverage, and, and importantly, that coverage 
in the sports sections of newspapers, in the health sections of newspapers, even got, I don't know, quite know why, but I got coverage in the LA Times. Um, uh, uh, I got coverage, we, we followed up with, with radio talk show tours, where these scientists to talk across uh, local radio stations across, uh, across the South and Southeast, um, and got a lot of online coverage, and it generated a conversation about extreme heat and health of football players that you simply couldn't have done if you just come out and said, we want to tell you the facts about climate change affecting extreme heat in the, in the South. Um, and, and what was nice about it was that climate change was in the story, but it wasn't the headline. Right? It was the second paragraph or the third paragraph. It was, it was just kind of the normal narrative. Right? So people are reading this stuff, and you have to be strategic about it and saying, oh, did you see that? Oh, and did you know that climate is a part of it? And it's, it's, it's not in your face. It's just part of the conversation. And in my view, it's really important to make climate change just part of the fact-based conversation in places across the country in a really, if you will, aggressive and assertive and smart and strategic way. And that's a lot of, not all of by any means, but a lot of what we've been doing. And I'm really pleased to say that, that as a consequence of this, um, uh, and we didn't really anticipate this, um, Texas, the state of Texas actually um, um, made a set of policy decisions to scale back uh, high school two-a-day workouts um, during periods of extreme summer heat. Um, uh, uh, a couple months later, really quite rapidly, now Texas might, you could call this climate adaptation. I don't think the state of Texas was calling this climate adaptation, but it's essentially what it is. Um, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's one means of having uh, the public conversation and the policy response that doesn't trip over the filters that, that people too often bring. Now we've been doing this across a range of issues. We've had a lot of opportunity. Um, with extreme weather this uh, past two years. Um, and this is just a kind of representative sample of the kinds of uh, coverage that we've been getting. I want to talk more about what impact that's been having in a minute, but I wanted to also to say that, that um, having scientists speak out, and we do a lot of media training for scientists. Um, we have about 18,000 scientists uh, in, a, in a network who come to us and make themselves available to be used and deployed, if you will, in, in this way across the country. Um, and um, uh, we also try to get lessons from the social sciences. Uh, one of the things we've learned, this is a conference I held at the University of Michigan last January, one of the key lessons from the social sciences who've been really studying the barriers to communication is that people actively filter information um, and that there are other messengers beyond scientists who may be much more effective than, than, than scientists and, in, in, if you will, validators. Um, so here, on, here on, the, uh, on the right, for example, at the bottom right is um, uh, the Reverend uh, 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 Rich Sizek, Rich Sizek, who's the head of the New Evangelical, Evangelical Partnership for the for the Common Good, who is a, a deeply religious man in the Evangelical, a very active leader in the Evangelical community, who's been very active in engaging uh, 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 people of faith, uh, people of the Evangelical faith, uh, on this issue. Cares deeply about the science. On the left is um, former Representative uh, Bob Inglis, South Carolina, deeply conservative. Uh, uh, former member of Congress, uh, deeply conservative, who uh, for a variety of reasons had what he would call his own conversion experience on the science and is very actively engaged in speaking to Republican uh, uh, audiences across the country, um, small groups and large, and really trying to build a conversation about free market approaches to addressing the challenges of climate change, where again, you can start with the facts and then really debate what to do about it. Um, and. We've been working with each of them and many others, and, and there are a lot of unsung uh, leaders like this across the country who we are working to elevate uh, their voices. So, for example, in South Florida, um, we're now working with uh, mayors and county commissioners and city planners, um, all of whom in a very active way and very differently than, say, North Carolina, are in conversation with scientists about how to prepare for sea level rise in Dade County and elsewhere. It's an issue which they're taking seriously. It's an issue that they're being very pragmatic about, um, but it's kind of under the radar screen, right? They're just doing their work. Um, so part of our job in, in collaboration with them is to raise their profile, um, to bring them to the attention uh, for a variety of, of tools and techniques through the media uh, uh, at a state level, national state in Florida, at a national level, hopefully begin to create conversations between what they're doing uh, as local leaders uh, with their colleagues in North Carolina, for example, or in other states so that we can elevate not just scientists' voices, but the voice of, of others who 
who are taking action already to prepare for climate change and are really much more interested in having that kind of pragmatic conversation than in debating, uh, re-debating or re-debating re the, the, the facts of the matter. Um, and so that's a big body of work that, that we're just really launching, and I think you'll see some fruits of that labor uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Anybody remember what this image is? What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, this is, um, those are the seven, were the seven CEOs of the um, uh, major tobacco companies in the United States. The date was uh, April 1994. The location was the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, uh, Subcommittee on Health and the Environment, chaired by Henry Waxman. Um, uh, and it was a moment that was captured at the, uh, at the time on the relatively few number of media outlets that existed. It was on the evening news on CBS and NBC and, and ABC and the national newspapers because what they were saying under oath um, was that nicotine is not addictive. They did not believe nicotine was addictive. They didn't believe that cigarettes caused lung cancer. Um, and this is 1994. At the time, people, the, the ground was prepared. You may remember the Surgeon General, first Surgeon General report on, on the health risks of tobacco came out 30 years earlier. 1960, whoops, two, I believe. Um, uh, and for a long period of time, the public was deeply confused about uh, the health risks of tobacco. And it's, a conf it's, it's statistical. It's a confusing issue. Some people smoke and don't get cancer. Some people get cancer and don't smoke. Um, but the science was very clear. That relationship was being, uh, was being strengthened by, 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 uh, by smoking. Um, and, of course, the, the uh, industry uh, internal, memo, internal memo from R.J. Reynolds famously said, you know, doubt is our product. Uh, some of you may have read the book by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway on Merchants of Doubt, sort of the efforts by, in this case, the tobacco industry to foment uncertainty about the science in order to de delay or deny regulation. Um, and that worked for some time. Um, but by 1994, there was enough work being done to prepare the ground from public health community. Um, so that, uh, and evidence from documents that had been released from the industry that they were actively misinforming, um, that by the time this kind of watershed moment happened, people knew they were uh, misspeaking. Um, and that was, a, that was a watershed moment. It really led to a bipartisan response in Congress to begin to regulate uh, tobacco in a way that would not have happened but for this uh, moment. And, and it, I have to say this gives me hope um, you know, where, the, where the public is on climate now is not where we will always be. One never knows where that watershed moment will be on, a, on an issue, but, um, but the signal of climate change is further e increasing from the noise of natural variation, and um, something will happen as long as we're preparing the ground. And I think of a lot of our work to help people get the science in a fundamental way. We don't expect people, the public, to be scientists, but to stop debating it. Um, is creates an opportunity that we'll begin to have, as we already have really in California uh, and in much of Europe, a, um, a national conversation about what to do about uh, the issue rather than uh, whether it's a real one. And you can see this in some of the polling data. Again, I'll, I'll take um, optimism wherever I can get it. Um, this is also from Tony the Sarawitz came out last fall that in part as a result of the um, uh, uh, extreme uh, weather, if you ask people that some people say global warming made each of these following events worse. How much do you agree or disagree? Really, contra to the earlier polls I showed you, quite a remarkable majority of people across the country um, agree or, or, or somewhat agree that um, much of the extreme events uh, that they witnessed over the past, uh, in this case, the past year, um, whether accurately or not, in the case of Hurricane Irene, um, were made worse by, by global warming. And so I think. You know, that's an example of a kind of forcing effect that is leading people to think differently about the issue than they might have otherwise. I want to just, I want to transition for a minute, though, if I can, from the specifics of climate change. Um, and we could talk a lot more about it if you'd like. Um, uh, to take a step back and, and put this in a little bit of context. So, um, as I said at the outset and at a couple points throughout the talk, um, uh, the, the challenge we face on climate change is not is not singular. We obviously had a similar challenge on, on tobacco, and we lost 30 years from the time that we knew that the health risks were serious before we were able to take uh, uh, regulatory action. Uh, and there are many other issues where 
science doesn't really have an effective seat at the table around um, public understanding and public discourse and public policy. So we at the Union of Concerned Scientists, in collaboration with a number of, of colleagues in the academic community, decided to try to create a, a, a center, a Center for Science and Democracy, to look at the fundamental systemic challenges rather than the issue-specific challenges to bring um, pragmatic reasoning and science-based information to, as this mission says, to strengthen our democracy by advancing the essential role of science, evidence-based decision-making, and constructive debate as a means to improve the health, security, and prosperity of all people. It's kind of a big topic. Um, uh, and we've just launched this. We've just hired um, my colleague Andy Rosenberg, who was formerly the chief scientist at, at Conservation International and a leader at um, at marine fisheries for many years and the, the battles over over fishery stocks in, in New England used to debates about, about science and decision making in that domain um, to uh, lead this work. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about the, the, the specifics. We're really just getting started, but I do want to talk about a couple pieces of it very briefly and open this up for a conversation. So we want to we want to bring people across disciplines together to solve problems and do it in a public facing way. Um, we want to bring uh, uh, a much broader group of non-scientist opinion leaders, thought leaders, um, to speak to the values of science in our democracy um, and to speak to it forcefully so that, for example, if the uh, editorial page of the Wall Street Journal misrepresents science, in this case on climate change, which they've done a fair bit of recently, we'll have business leaders who are willing to stand up and say, you know, that's just not correct. Um, doesn't happen yet. Uh, and we want to really help further get scientists out of their cubby holes of their research labs um, and engage in a, in a much more robust uh, two-way dialogue with members of the public so that when people are asked what scientist um, you know, they, they know, they'll actually name someone other than Albert Einstein. And, and, um, and, and to think about scientists as members of their community and colleagues and people who have something to say um, as, uh, as part of the democratic process. And for many scientists, this is a hard thing. Um, all of the incentives are in another direction, uh, and there are many active disincentives uh, uh, and discouragement, really, in a cultural sense within the university system to engage in the public discourse and certainly to talk about your values, right? to talk about, talk about what you bring to a conversation. And I like to talk about, and certainly to advocate for, for anything other than research funding. Um, uh, and, um, you know, but it, in a lot of conversations I have with colleagues in the academic community, I like to remind them that when you get a PhD, you, you, you don't lose your citizenship. Um, and scientists who are often reluctant to engage in the, if you will, in the fray, um, have an opportunity, and I would argue, as citizens, an obligation to do so. I see it. Thank you. Um, just one word on some of the work we've been doing just last week, uh, looking at these kind of cross-cutting issues. We held a, uh, what we call a science and democracy forum at the museum in partnership with the museum on improving citizen access to government scientific information, uh, all the challenges that um, we have data in the federal government that is not often available for, for the public to, to use and to understand. Um, and some of that sometimes has serious consequences, such as information that was withheld about the uh, levels of formaldehyde in the trailers that were used, um, for example, after, after Hurricane Katrina, um, and looking for ways in which we can improve public access to uh, scientific information. We held a uh, a public-facing conference with leaders uh, across the political landscape and, and a group of panelists, and we're now in the process of bringing that information to bear on a set of recommendations for the next administration, which I hope, no matter um, who's in charge, um, will, through our work and that of many others, and I hope the work of all of you, if you'd like to join us or collaborate in any possible way, um, whoever's in charge will be a much more forceful um, public advocate uh, for science in the uh, policy arena, arena than we've seen uh, in recent decades. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. So um, I've been instructed by Tomiko to uh, take questions and to repeat them so that they can be picked up by the microphone. So, yes, sir. Uh, a comment and a question. Yeah. I'm a sociologist, and I think you need to make sure you include sociologists because we do know some things about uh, why people believe the things they do and how to persuade people and so on, and that's part of what you're up against. Uh, my question is, um, what kind
kind of energy maybe works, uh, doesn't have terrible effects on the earth. And for instance, solar you might think, but then there's all the mining and all kinds of other things that go into production of solar panels. So what, what would you advocate? So let me repeat back what you said succinctly if I can, so that your first point was to uh, remark that we need to engage with uh, sociologists and other social scientists. And I just briefly mentioned this conference at the uh, University of Michigan, and I'm pleased to say we're doing much of that. Um, there's some tremendous work in the social sciences, including some of you may want to go to a website called culturalcognition.net uh, by Dan Cahan and his colleagues at Yale, but others in the sociology have been really thinking hard about, about how people process and filter information, and we've been working with them in, in collaboration. I'd be interested in your specific ideas about how we can improve that. But your question was about, um, you know, what are our energy options, given that any energy um, approach we take, we're going to need to power um, and, and amplify the, the energy available to many developing countries. What do we do? Everything at scale has, uh, has uh, side impacts that are not necessarily uh, positive. And I agree with you. There's no, there's no, um, there's no silver bullet here. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we – we need to start with the fact that energy, in my view, needs to be uh, uh, very low to zero carbon. Uh, and there are a variety of ways in which we can do that. I think if we try to expand a single approach to energy, as you say, solar uh, or wind or uh, nuclear, um, at scale, it's going to be, there are all have side consequences. We're always going to be managing trade-offs. Um, uh, what I've seen most effective is a diverse portfolio of energy approaches. Um, and, and we may need, given the scale of, of changes that we're now seeing, uh, energy uh, sources that I might not prefer because of their side impacts. I personally think we should not be subsidizing um, major investments, which is really a high cost, uh, in, in nuclear power uh, because of the security uh, and safety risks and, and literally the high costs of, of their adoption. Others may disagree. Um, uh, and, you know, if you, if you get our prices right and we look at um, – uh, uh, finding uh, appropriate ways to solve the, co the, the side impacts. I think we can do a lot more than we do just by – do now by just, if you will, putting them out without their consideration. So I'm on the board, for example, of an organization called the American Wind Wildlife Institute. One of the biggest concerns about the rapid expansion of wind, and it is expanding relatively rapidly, is its impacts on biodiversity. So we've created an organization that brings together the leaders of most of the – CEOs of most of the major wind industry companies in the United States with most of the major – conservation organizations, Nature Conservancy, uh, Defenders of Wildlife, Audubon, and others, so that we can partner and create, if you will, a shared vision and a mapping for how to expand wind while minimizing the impacts on, on birds and bats in particular. That's just one example of thoughtful expansion of low-carbon energy. Um, uh, and we could go on about this, but let me stop and take other questions. Yes, ma'am. Suggesting that scientists should uh, should be stronger advocates for a certain causes, I wonder: Do you see a risk that um, the scientists who speak up publicly might be perceived by the public or even framed by certain organizations or groups um, as biased and maybe lose his or her standing as a you know unbiased, objective, fact-searching, true uh, sci scientist? Isn't that a risk or so? So. So if I can read the question, the, the question is really about isn't there a risk in when scientists engage in the public fray, right, uh, and advocate for uh, their values being applied, not just their facts. And, and I, I agree there is a risk, uh, and I think there are good ways to do it and less good ways to do it. Um, one of my um, personal role models and heroes in this work is, a, is, a, uh, is Mario Molina. Mario Molina, one of the uh, winners of the Nobel uh, Prize uh, for – the discovery of the role of chlorofluorocarbons in, um, in creating the ozone hole with Sherry Rowland and, and Paul Kreutzen. And um, uh, when he engaged in raising the, the concerns that he had understood to be uh, a function of the science he was discovering into the public dog, he got a lot of criticism from other scientists. And, you know, what, what, but ultimately that work uh, and his, if you will, advocacy for the science being heard, right? Um, uh, was one of the linchpins of what led to, in a relatively non-contentious way, um, the adoption of the Montreal Protocol and what we now see as a path forward for um, addressing this very serious issue. Um, and what Mario said, and I agree with this, is, is um, you know, if, if, um, 
uh, uh, that, that you just need to be clear about when you're speaking as a scientist and when you're speaking about your personal values. And I, I agree with that. I don't think scientists should be um, uh, muffled and, if you will, discouraged or not allowed to speak about their values because they're citizens too. But I do think we need to be very clear to do science that's rigorous and to do advocacy that's science-based as opposed to doing advocacy-driven science. Uh, and to make sure that when we do say, you know, as a scientist I can tell you this, and as a citizen, as a constituent, you know, I, I'd like you to consider something, you know, uh, taking this approach, that, that, that you have to be artful and careful about it, and it takes a lot of discipline, but I don't think we should be asking scientists any more than any other citizens to be um, uh, uh, taking off their citizenship, citizenship hat. So, uh, in the back. Yeah. First short question, I'm going to get my uncle's place to come to me uh, in nine times to make that happen. <laughs> is this the page where we can see the broadcast? Uh, the broadcast of this talk? Yeah. No, well, that's the page you can go to look at all the good things that the Union of Concerned Scientists is doing. So you can look at that. But Tomoko can tell you the page. Yes, actually. Um, you want to use it on the, you want to do it on the microphone? I mean, everybody who's watching it will know. <laughs> that's true. The library maintains uh, a website, and you can go to the homepage, loc.gov. You have to go past the fold, so to speak, down to where they feature a particular website, and under that, it's all the, webs uh, all the uh, webcasts. They feature a particular webcast. It takes about two months because we have um, many speakers. There are three today, for instance. And so it does take about two months for it to go through the process of vetting and um, uh, the collaboration between our public office and those who do the webcast. So you can look for those and others, and we have several science uh, webcasts that we do throughout the year. So I hope you will visit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Second question, sorry. Yeah. Um, you said sea level rise is the exact, uh, expected to rise one meter. The IPCC report is, uh, uh, you know, uh, is predicting 20 centimeters to 70 centimeters. Well, so there are a couple. Yes, I'm sorry. So I spoke to sea level rise on coastal North Carolina as being projected as about 39 inches, a little over a meter. And you cited, I, I presume that's that's the IPCC fourth assessment report in 2007, um, looking at the global average. So there are two things I would say about that. One is that the IPCC uh, report in 2007, looking at global averages, uh, 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 explicitly didn't take into account. Uh, the impact of um, land-based ice um, because the modeling was insufficiently uh, robust at the time. Um, more recent projections, um, including uh, uh, characterized by the IPCC and others, have increased uh, the sea level rise range when, when uh, land-based ice is included, the melting as in addition to the, the thermal expansion of seawater. But that's global average. And actual sea level rise varies tremendously across regions for a variety of reasons, as you may well know, depending on not just what's happening in the ocean, but what's happening on, on coastal land, whether um, there's subsidence in which the land is, is um, uh, uh, going down in, in, in uh, elevation and therefore relative sea level rise is higher, or whether in some cases it may be rising. Um, so the work done in coastal North Carolina was taking into account both the updated projections globally uh, and a set of analyses that looks specifically at sea level rise um, in coastal North Carolina. It's different, for example, than in coastal California or, or coastal Maine or, or the Gulf of Mexico or elsewhere. So it's a local projection. I'm happy to uh, point you to the uh, data on which that's based. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to get back to climate more specifically. <coughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the issue of gridlock, political gridlock in Washington and whether we're going to be looking at mostly state-based solutions like what was talked about in California. Florida or any kind of national plan. I, I peeked at GW when we hosted a salon on fracking last week and we had a lot of the industry leaders at the American Petroleum Institute and they all said they all think that they own the science too and saying yeah. that fracking is really not that dangerous and they're uh, they feel a little beleaguered too and, they, and then you also have the media campaigns with the energy voter and all that so I feel like the 
public is being manipulated in some ways and persuaded in some ways, but could Woodlock think of as a well grounded idea? So the if I can just repeat your question, the question is really what's what's the uh, what's the prognosis for um, uh, political action on climate change nationally as opposed to at a state-based level, just given the, the complicated polarization that we see across both the science and also the uh, solutions. Um, and I would say that um, uh, my own personal view is there's very little prospect for serious congressional action on climate change at a, at a, at a major scale uh, anytime soon, perhaps not till 2016. Um, uh, and there is considerable prospect for work at a state level. In fact, in November, um, the state of Michigan has a ballot initiative for the um, expansion of uh, its renewable energy standard that increases renewable energy uh, required to be produced from uh, available to the state to 30 percent by much of its 2025, what the date is. But that's a there are now. Um, 29, I believe, states plus the District of Columbia that have state-based renewable uh, uh, electricity standards, which have not been yet adopted nationally. So that's an example of a of a state policy that's in the works. Um, but there are actions at a state level, both with adaptation and mitigation, that are important to be supporting. Um, and we have seen, you know, even though they may not be as major as a price on carbon or a economy-wide cap, um, and I see colleagues here who've been actively engaged in in this work, um, we did see. Um, just uh, this past month, the further elaboration, uh, and if you will, the final rulemaking on the um, uh, expanded federal uh, fuel economy standards that raise fuel economy to well over 50 miles per gallon as a, as a target uh, uh, by the mid of the uh, 2020s. Um, so there are, there, in that case, a sector-specific policy that's been adopted, um, and we'll see. But I don't, I think it's unrealistic to expect uh, gridlock to disappear uh, in, you know, uh, February of 2013. Uh, yes, Anna. Hi, Peter. Um, so <coughs> I was struck by your slide of, with the political crossover votes. Yeah. Um, and what I was struck <coughs> by is that even by 1994, I mean, there were a couple of still crossovers, but not too many. on climate change, so in 2000, say, there wasn't actually a huge difference between Republicans and Democrats, but then that has grown over time. And maybe I was late, so maybe you did that, showed that graph um, uh, earlier in your speech. Um, but yeah, that's the one that, that struck me. And so I was just wondering if, if you had views on, um, you know, even though the, there was kind of less political crossover climate was still not as politicized, and why that's changed over sort of the last decade. Well, so the question, if I can repeat it, is um, uh, th this figure seems to indicate that um, uh, American politics became highly polarized by, the, um, uh, by 1994, uh, 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 increasing, but not with a great deal of further increase over the next uh, several decades. Um, but um, uh, but at least polling data on climate suggested that this wasn't really a polarized issue, politically divided, until somewhat later, and that's that's correct. The the um, uh, the data I've seen suggests that by the late 1990s, um, after the second assessment report of the IPCC, which came out in nine, 1998, I believe, um, and the formation of the Global Climate Coalition, which was an industry uh, major industry. Um, uh, coalition dedicated to constraining uh, policy action on, on climate, including through misinformation on the science, um, that we began to see the partisan issues. As, as climate policy got closer to being something which had real tangible possibility, um, that's, you know, for a range of reasons why or when the political um, uh, divide over that issue that became evident, people began paying attention to it in a different kind of way, um, showed up in in, 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 in polling, and um, we can talk about why that might be, but I think that's in part a reflection of the difference between this curve, which is very, this graph is obviously very broad brush. Um, so, yes, sir.
So your question is, from a European perspective, why did the public uh, acceptance of the science of climate change so rapidly drop in the in the middle of the, the last decade, right? Mm -hmm. um, which happened uh, uh, in a way that was timed around the release of the IPCC report uh, and the you may recall the the kerfuffle over the uh, emails that were uh, stolen from the University of East Anglia that purported to show scientists behaving badly. Um, uh, and um, uh, it certainly was leveraged more than here, I, more than in Europe, although there was plenty of news coverage of that, certainly in London and in, in the UK, um, toward a misinformation campaign that was quite active. I, you know, it's hard to know exactly why that had so much more traction here. I mean, it played into the polarized um, uh, social discourse, political discourse we were already having around the politics of it. So it was feeding into a decision set of policies that were being considered around uh, cap and trade, for example. Uh, in this country, it was, advanced, it was in advance of major policy choices that were being um, developed nationally. Uh, and so it, the time was, if you will, kind of ripe for that information to be um, put to use uh, to further public confusion in a very active way. If you're in the business of trying to stop legislation, um, you use every tool you have in your toolkit. Um, uh, if that legislation isn't happening or there isn't a policy, then you're probably going to do something else with your time. Um, and so I think the, it was the kind of, you know, perfect storm, if you will, of information that was, uh, that was put to uh, ill use for the, for the purposes of a very near-term policy decision that, that really um, latched on to the construct at the time that the, the science was uncertain, that scientists might have been misleading people, and another set of uh, all, all those pieces that came up. But I would say that as we paint the American public as confused on climate change, and there is legitimate information on that to support it, it, it's also at least worth noting to our European colleagues that, that confusion around the science isn't strictly a, an American um, issue, right? So there are um, public perception of risk in Europe around, say, GMOs are very different than they are in the United States. Public perception of risk over tobacco may be very different than it is in the United States. And, and one can argue about where that per risk perception is closer to the facts or not. Um, but I would just want to make sure that at least I'm not making the case that there's something distinctive about the American public that has a harder time um, uh, assessing the scientific evidence uh, and risks associated with, with uh, information around health or, or environment that is somehow worse than uh, publics elsewhere. I, I don't think that's the case. I think there are particular cultural attributes of the, United States, of, of the U.S. that makes this issue particularly challenging, but maybe less challenging for other issues. Yeah, Rachel. Well, we've had, it's a great question. I'd love to, uh, maybe this polling is being take, is taking place. I, I haven't seen any more recent data. Um, we've certainly had two years of a lot of extreme uh, weather. Who knows what next year will bring? It's not, it's not going to be a uniform accelerated increase in extreme events. Um, uh, and so where public opinion is on this, I just, as of, as of uh, 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 October 2012, I have no idea. Sir. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So you're, you're, you're pointing to the uh, 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 perception uh, that uh, global warming uh, uh, made record snowfalls worse, which is counterintuitive for many people about how that could be the case. But I would just argue that, yes, that's true. And I would take that as encouraging. And there's good evidence for why there's a fingerprint of warming and more intense precipitation, whether rain or snow, um, uh, over the past couple of years. But the of course, the counterexample one has to be concerned about is the is Hurricane Irene, right? There's, there's very little evidence that um, 
uh, human warming made that hurricane worse. Um, uh, and I would guess, in fact, I've seen some data suggesting that people do attribute um, the kind of freakish nature of tornadoes that we've seen to, to warming, although there's, you know, the mechanistic basis for that as well as the evidentiary basis for that is, is, um, is very close to zero. Um, so um, people are doing their own, if you will, attribution science um, uh, in the absence of uh, scientific information. We now are getting much better at closer to real-time abilities to characterize the impact of warming on extreme weather. So we, know, we now know that the, um, uh, through a variety of mostly statistical techniques that the, uh, the extreme summer uh, heat in 2011 in Texas, for example, which was in large part a function of a La Nina, the cooling of the sea surface temperatures off the, uh, off, um, the uh, southern Pacific, off of South America, the, off of Peru, that that has an uh, impact on warming in that part of the United States, um, but that it was likely made far worse by a combination of La Nina and, and anthropogenic warming. But it's very difficult to tease those apart in real time. Um, but of course, that's how people pay attention in real time. And so there's an interesting body of research that's now underway to try to create, if you will, as much as possible kind of real-time attribution service to begin to let people know within the limits of the science really what we can say about the role of warming versus all the natural variability that will continue. Tomoko. Um, the Fukushima, after the Fukushima incident, yeah. um, Japanese are now looking at because the country aware of the global warming, you know, the reduction of consumption of energy, that's, that's the focus. And uh, how about this country, if we can do that? <laughs> you know, the, because so much of side effect of the different energy uh, production, so. So the question is, in Japan, following Fukushima, there's been a lot of uh, public conversation about reducing energy consumption, which is obviously one way to reduce uh, global warming. Um, and what can we do about that? What's happening here with that with that regard? I think the the conversation around energy in this country is less about reducing consumption than, than about increasing efficiency, um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, um, that's a much easier conversation to have. And um, and there's an awful lot that can be gained through increasing uh, energy efficiency. And um, a lot of it is economically the low hanging fruit, although often it's very difficult to to get people to adopt um, efficiency practices. It's even difficult to get uh, Congress to um, uh, adopt standards that require uh, more efficient light bulbs. Um, uh, uh, so some very common sense issues of efficiency, sometimes they're challenging to implement, even though they often save money. Um, but, uh, but here there's a, again, it depends on the state. Some states, California, for example, has adopted a tremendous amount of statewide efficiency measures, and the decoupling of economic development from energy consumption has really happened quite dramatically in, in California, as opposed to some other states. Um, so. Um, efficiency is very much part of the mix, um, less so reducing consumption. Um, because time is running out, please join me to um, thank you, the Dr. Fumhoff. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.